what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Mayor Eric Adams, so great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I always enjoy being around lifelong learners. You know, I always believe I heard it somewhere. Some people go through life. Some people grow through life. Mm -hmm. I like, I like to that. believe I'm, I'm going to continue to try to grow. Well, speaking of life, I want to go back to when you were 15 years old. I know this was a big moment in your life. And you're arrested and beaten by police officers. And, and I can imagine, I, I can only imagine the type of impact that would have on somebody. Uh, what happened after that day and how did that change the trajectory of your life? And it's interesting because uh, it's, Issues or incidents can uh, break you or build you. And I watch people that have negative encounters and it breaks them and they never really get back on track. And probably what kept me on track was when I came home from the precinct uh, the next day after going to a juvenile facility, uh, my mom sat down in that small modest kitchen and she stated that, you know, baby, you're going to go through uh, some dark moments in your life and you have to make the determination if they're if they are burials or plantings hmm. and you have to learn how to turn pain into purpose she was not aware of the beating she knew of the arrest and she was speaking to that but it just made me really think and i just decided that that was not going to be a burial it was, it was, it was going to be a planting and it really just took me in another direction. I, I read that uh, a mentor of yours, uh, Reverend and civil rights leader, Herbert Daughtry, encouraged you to change the system from within. How did you go on to do that? Uh, I, I became aware of Reverend Daughtry after a young man named Clifford Glover was killed. He was a 10 year old child shot in the back by an officer named Officer Shea. And that was the first time Reverend Daughtry was on my radar because Clifford Glover was shot blocks from my house. And late in life, he was involved in an incident with a businessman named Arthur Miller. And he was killed by police with a chokehold. And he started a, a march and a call for justice because of that. And I joined an organization that Reverend Herbert Daughtry created called Black United Front. It was a sort of an umbrella group for various organization, organizations to come together. And during that time, we were dealing with many police issues, uh, negative encounters with communities, and one of them involved a young man named Randolph Evans. He was shot by a housing police officer. And shortly after that, Reverend Daughtry uh, brought together a group of young men and told us we had to go to the law enforcement community and fight from within. This was after a series of shootings after Randy Randolph Evans and others just continued to happen. Some, you know, some years passed by of protests and he said, we can't only protest from the outside, we must protest from the inside. And I reluctantly went inside. I was, I was a computer geek at the time. I wanted to be a computer programmer. Uh, and instead, you know, sometimes, uh, you choose life and then God choose for you. So you, you become a police officer. It's not like you only did it for a little bit too. You, you got in and then you got promoted. You, it, it feels like people saw the leadership qualities within you. I imagine you had to work really hard and you're getting promoted. What was your career like as a police officer and what did you do to get promoted to captain and to be, to be known as a leader within the group? And that's interesting when you stated about working hard because I had to. Uh, I was diagnosed or learned I was dyslexic when I got into college. Uh, I did not know I was dyslexic throughout my K through 12 experience. In fact, I was bullied because I was called the dumb student. And I stumbled onto my dyslexia when I was in college. And I, a young person was listening to a video in another aisle in the library 
And I heard it and I took it out and looked at it myself and discovered that I was dyslexic. And so I went from a D student to being on the Dean's list once I got the help that I needed. But the significant part about it is that I knew that I would never beat you with, with brilliance. I'm going to beat you with endurance. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to surrender. I'm going to continue to uh, fight. And that, what I thought was a curse, that dark moment of not being able to learn was not. It turned out to be a blessing. It turned out that I knew I had to work harder uh, to figure out how to exist in a society where the norm was not dyslexic. Being dyslexic, dyslexic, as you know, is not that you're dumb, you learn differently, but the society is not built around learning differently. So I had to adjust to what society uh, presented. And that's what I did in the police department. I studied hard, uh, but at the same time, I started a, an organization called 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement Who Care. And we wanted to fight for public safety and justice in the police department. <clears throat> and we did that. We were officers in the, in the various law enforcement agencies where we spoke out against anti-police uh, practices or bad police practices. But we also spoke out about crime. This was during the crack era uh, when crime was uh, serious in, in New York. We were dealing with almost uh, over 2,000 homicides a year and 98,000 robberies and felonious assaults. And so we had a combination of things we wanted to do. When you see um, or hear other politicians, even a lot in your own party, say or utter the phrase, defund the police, what do you think? They just don't get it. And they're speaking from the sterilized environment of their executive chambers. They're not speaking on the ground. That is not what everyday New Yorkers want. And it's sort of disappointing when you think about it, that we have turned into a country, in my opinion, where our emphasis and focus are on the small number of individuals who participate in criminal, dangerous, and illegal behavior. I think our country in general and our city specifically, we have turned our backs on everyday innocent New Yorkers that are doing the right thing. If you do an analysis of the bills and laws that were passed in the last few years, you see laws and bills that are passed for those who commit crimes and do violent things. You cannot point to a bill that points to those who are the victims of these crimes. Like what do we do when the primary breadwinner is murdered and leave a family behind. We're not stepping in at all and stating even something simple as, simple as we will pay your mortgage or rent for the year so that you can just normalize this new reality. That takes place nowhere. And someone needs to advocate for innocent people. And I'm going to do that. When you were running for mayor, um, I saw a, a quote who you said, you're not really running against a candidate. Uh, you were really running against a, a, a movement. What, what did you mean by that? Well, it's, it's very interesting uh, that I believe that there are co-conspirators to the realities that we're facing right now. And that's the far, far left and the far, far right. I believe that the two of them don't realize, but they're creating the environment of, that many of us are facing. Uh, the far, far left believe that no matter, for the most part, no matter who carries a gun, uh, they should not be held accountable if they use it or if they carry it. Uh, they should be basically uh, allowed to continue what they're doing. And the far, far right believes everyone should carry a gun. Uh, when you look at the ruling of the Supreme Court, uh, I think it slaps in the face of public safety. And I'm a responsible gun owner. I believe that uh, Americans have the right to carry a gun, uh, but there should be some real restrictions on, on that right. I'm sure our constitutional forefathers, when they made that decision, they were not thinking about some of the uh, artillery that we're seeing right now, and we should have a real responsibility with that right. But that is what I believe I'm, I'm fighting against. I'm fighting against those that want to divide our, our party. And I just don't sub subscribe to the theory. When you look over my left shoulder, uh, you see uh, that flag that has blue and red together. 
Uh, I don't think we should divide the flag or divide the country by blue and red states. There's only one state that I know, and that's called the United States. It feels like when I travel the country, and I do quite frequently for speaking engagements, uh, engagements and other things, it feels like a lot of people are really aligned with what you're saying. And, and I'm, I'm in alignment with you. I, I would say certainly not on the far end of either spectrum, but more in the middle. And I had Governor Charlie Baker on, who seems like a moderate Republican. You're more, I would say, a moderate Democrat. It feels like more and more people, at least when I'm out in the world, are aligned with you, yet what we see at least, it feels like online, in the media, is so much of the far right or far left, which most of us don't identify with. And I believe your assessment and your analysis is so accurate. I told my team, uh, when I was running for mayor, and I told them that what I'm hearing on the ground is what I'm feeling, that people want proper police and justice. There's simple things that they want. And my team pushed back at first until they went and took a poll, and then the reality was right there in the poll numbers. And I knew it was my task to allow people not to hear me, but to feel me, to feel mm -hmm. that I saw myself as one of them. I just want an environment where we can raise healthy children and families. And I think that we have betrayed the countless number of New Yorkers and Americans uh, by, by not doing that. I use this, this quote all the time from, Arch, from Archbishop Bishop Desmond Tutu. We spend a lifetime pulling people out of the river. No one goes upstream and prevent them from falling in in the first place. We're a downstream city in a downstream country. All we do is pull people out of the river. It's time to go upstream. And that's when you're going to find the average Americans upstream wanting to make sure we can stop throwing people, pushing people, and watching people fall in the river. Do you get, um, is it hard for you within your own party at times, though? Especially in New York, I could see as some would call those, oh, the coastal elites, you know, the things you hear online. Do you, do you, do you get any... Uh, I don't know if I call it fighting, but disagreements or people trying to bring you down from within your own party? Uh, yes, you do. Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, people want to live in a universe of idealism, but idealism collides with realism. Uh, it's idealistic uh, to say that people should sleep wherever they want, sleeping on the streets and in encampments and in tents and in cardboard boxes. But during the month of January, when I took office, I went out and visited those locations. And you know what I saw? I saw human waste inside those tents. I saw drug paraphernalia. I saw people dealing with medical and emotional issues, psychological issues, uh, did not have the medication they needed, stale food, not access to clean clothing or shower. Idealism says they can live on the streets and it's no big issue. Realism says that that's inhumane. And I refuse to accept that. And so when we put in place a humane way of moving people into shelters and wraparound services, what we, what we call safe havens. There was a large pushback of advocates who felt as though I was being inhumane by telling people you couldn't live on the streets when we were walking past these people every day. And so what you have to do, if your heart is telling it's right, I believe you have to ignore the noise and look at your North Star and be focused on that North Star. My North Star, was to make sure people stop falling in the river. The other thing about you, I think, is uh, an authenticity, uh, a genuine guy. Uh, the New York Times has called you the mayor who never sleeps. You get up early, you work hard, you stay out late, you go out, you go out to clubs. Uh, I, I've, I read a story that said people told you to put the, the Tito's and soda down when you were getting your picture taken with fellow New Yorkers. And you're like, no, it's fine. I can hold on to this drink while I'm getting my picture taken. So you seem like a guy who's not afraid to be real. You're not, there's no uh, facade of like, I have to be a certain person. Can you tell me more about how you have the security to do that? And, and you know what? I love that example. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> right. You know, I don't want to be a fake. I drink Tito's and club. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And so what am I going to do? Hide it until one day someone sees it and says, oh, wait a minute, we caught you drinking a Tito's in club? No, I don't. And there's some days I enjoy a nice cigar and a single malt scotch. <laughs> you know, I think Americans don't want a leader that could, could only uh, bear the weight of the city. 
They want a leader that they can enjoy having a beer with. Yeah. You know, it's, we're tired of the pretentious of false images. As I say, one of my quotes, and they probably a lot out there, but one of my quotes uh, is that I'm perfectly imperfect. This is a perfectly imperfect city and perfection is not the issue, it's dedication. And when people want to judge that I enjoy uh, going to visit my, my nightlife establishment so I can see the workers in those establishments and talk to them and let them know that uh, this is uh, not a nine to five city and I'm not going to be a nine to five mayor. This is a city that never sleeps. So I should not be caught taking a nap. I need to be reaching out to every resident in the city. If they're doing midnight hours at work as a nurse, as a police officer, they need to see their mayor. If they're doing four to 12s, they need to see their mayors. And I need to support all the systems in the city. And yes, it's unorthodox. Uh, yet, yet I don't, yes, I don't fit into the box. Uh, you know, I'm probably the first uh, bald-headed mayor that you've seen in the city of New York. So, you know, I don't fit into the patterns of what people believe. But you know what? New Yorkers don't fit into the patterns. Americans don't fit into the patterns. We have days when we are ultra-conservative, days when we are ultra-liberal. We, we think differently based on a topic, and we should not allow people to put us in a box. And that's uncomfortable to the decision makers, I believe. It feels like you are the exact guy I would want to vote for for president. Seriously. <laughs> uh, that's partially why I wanted to do this. Is that something you think about? I could run the city from the country from New York. You know, I, I enjoy being a mayor and impacting on the lives of people. You know, I tell you, Ryan, it is said all the time that the mayor of the city of New York is the second most difficult job in politics. You know, my response, when does the hard part start? There's not been one day when I've been, I have been overwhelmed, stressed really? out. Uh, there have been difficult moments to lose police officer Moore and Rivera, uh, to watch some of the violence that we're fighting against, uh, to the uncertainty of our economics. And there's difficult moments, but I do not feel as though this is a hard job. Uh, this is a job that you get up, you do the best you can, and the universe is going to decide the rest. That's not my job uh, to decide those things outside my span of control. I wake up every day committed to the people of this city, and I give my all, and I'm not going to leave one drop on the field when these four years are over, I'm going to leave everything I have on the, on, on, on the field. You know, credit goes uh, to the man in the mirror, in, in, the, in the arena, who's actually in the arena. It doesn't go to uh, the credit, doesn't go to those who are uh, naysayers or who credit the doer of deeds. It goes to the man whose face is uh, full of dust, sweat and blood, but it's actually in the arena. And Roosevelt said that then, it's true right now. I'm the man in the arena. It feels like an exhausting job though, man. It was 24 seven, like it really is. There's no real days off. <laughs> no, it's is not. It? It's seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, but I love every moment of it. Uh, How do you I, have the I, energy to do it? I mean, it, like I said, I feel like most people at some point would just, oh, you know, and it feels like you don't do that. It's a combination. You know, sometimes we, we think of our physical exhaustion, but we fail to realize that that's driven by our mental exhaustion. If you allow yourself to be absorbed by every critic and every person who criticizes you, uh, you are going to be exhausted both, both physically and mentally. And I don't. You know, I wake up every morning, my routine is clear. To have that green smoothie, Med meditate, do that exercise, and start the day and get ready for the day that's in front of me. And when you look at it, when you've gone through so many crises and tragedies and ups and downs, you realize that there is a flow to a crisis. You don't stay in it forever. People don't see themselves through crises. They see themselves at that moment. When I struggled with uh, vision loss before, Due to advanced stages of diabetes, the doctor said I would be blind in a year and I was going to lose some of my fingers and toes because of permanent nerve damage and I had an ulcer. I decided uh, not to sit back and say, how do I live di with diabetes? I looked and found how do you reverse diabetes and go into a whole food plant-based diet allowed me to reverse my vision loss, my nerve damage, 
uh, you know, lose the weight that I've been trying to lose for a long time and I, I feel fine. But that was a lesson. Remember what I said that mommy told me at 15, baby, you're going to be in dark places. They're either burials or plantings. With that lesson, instead of saying that at dark places, I didn't say, woe is me. I said, why not me? If I can get diabetes, then darn it, there's a way I can get rid of it at the same time. Mm. You you sound like you've also done a great job of surrounding yourself by great mentors, other great leaders. Uh, your who, your board of advisors, sounds like it's really good. Working with your team leading up to this has been just awesome. Um, when you think about all of the great leaders that you've interacted with over the course of your career, what are some of the commonalities you found among leaders who have sustained excellence over an extended period of time? And that's a great question uh, because uh, consistency and uh, don't beat yourself up because you stumble and fail. In fact, fail is the first act in learning. You're supposed to fail. If you're not failing, then you are stationary. Creating mm -hmm. that safe culture to try something new and learn within that is the answer to your question. The Wright brothers didn't take flight the first time. They failed over and over again. Those who could push through the failures, those who can continue to go, I strongly believe on the other side of that failure is a success you're looking for. Far too many people take the failure as that they have failed. No, you're just going through the process of learning like a lifelong learner, reading books of other leaders and learning from what they have done. And those common denominators are clear. Uh, I don't care who it is, if it's Dr. King, uh, if it's Mother Teresa, uh, no matter who it is, uh, they've gone through some sad down moments, some dark moments, but they push through those dark moments. And I think all of them saw through the dark moments and realized it was only a very once only a planting, I should say, once you know, and uh, Ryan, what I've learned the most during my darkest moments, I ask myself a, the question, there's something I'm supposed to learn right now. Hmm. Absorb this moment, because if you just wallow in the darkness, you're going to fail to see the lesson. There is no dark moment that's not filled with the lesson. There's something I'm supposed to learn right now and just absorb it and go with it and you'll learn it. Where does that perspective come from? That seems so like you've done a lot of work on yourself and you've probably had help too from others, I have to imagine. Like, where does that come from to be able to be this, is it self-actualized? I'm not sure. Comfort in your own skin? There's something I gotta learn from this in the moments of when it's really hard because a lot of us, we feel sorry for ourselves, we complain, and we eventually get through it, and maybe we look back, maybe we don't, but it feels like you're actually able to do this in the moment. Well, I think it's a number of things. Number one, there was an old soulful, soulful ballad. If you take a close look at my face, you'll see my smile is out of place, and you'll see the tracks of my tears. We often judge ourselves by others, but if you look closely, people are hurting. Yes, they dress up their pain with a nice car, a nice suit, or even a title or a certificate or degree that hangs on their wall or a company that they own. But if you look closely, you will see that we're all scared. We're all afraid. We're all third grade children trying to figure this out. And once you understand that no matter who's standing in front of you or who's making decisions that would deal with the immediate parts of your life, that they're going through the same fear. Do my wife still loves me? Am I balding? Am I able to still deal with the challenge in front of me? Trust me, everyone has those issues. And once you know that, you start to realize that you're no different than anyone else, no matter what they acquired or what you have not acquired, no matter when you dropped a ball, or no matter when you made the mistake, you just start to understand that, you know, as the quote says, a bend in the road is not the end of the road. All you have to do is make the turn. And every day I'm just making the turn. Your team and I have talked a lot about uh, how well read you are and, and how we might do uh, some learning leader uh, book club stuff in the future, which I would love to, by the way. Uh, given your schedule, you know, it, it, you're back to back to back 24-7. When uh, making the time to read 
seems like it's it's very important to you. And I talk and work with leaders from all different uh, industries, and a lot of them say, oh, you don't understand, I don't have time, man, I don't have time. Well, I think the mayor of New York City has to be one of the busiest, if not the busiest person in the world. How, what do you do to ensure you're working on yourself, you're educating yourself, you're reading, you're making sure you're not just fighting fires all day, but you're, you're, you're trying to get better? I love that. That's, that, is a, uh, that is a great question. Now I know why your, your podcast is so popular. You know? <laughs> That's a great question. Think about it for a moment. As I always tell the team, uh, a pilot gets into the cockpit and before he takes off, he's checking his instrument panels. He's making sure that everything is there. He's not ever going to say, well, I'm in a rush. I don't have time. I'm going to take off. He has a checklist. No matter how many times he flies, he goes through that checklist. And so making sure that you are taking care of yourself before you take flight every day is crucial. You have to have time to do that. There's a reason uh, when you hear the stewardess say, if cabin pressure drops and the oxygen mask falls down, place the mask on yourself before you place it on someone else. You're not good to yourself. You're not going to be good to others. And so if I need to read those 10 pages at night or if I have to get an audio book and walk around as I brush my teeth in the morning or exercise or sit there on my stationary bike, I'm going to do that. I'm going to have to constantly refuel myself with the right uh, energy. And so we focus on the calories we consume when we place food in our mouths, but our brains are also places that we feed ourselves. And so some people are dealing with intellectual obesity because they consume just junk food all day, every day, by what they read and hear. I want something nutritional, and that's why I try to find the right items that's going to nourish my brain, as well as the right food that I'm going to eat that's going to nourish my body. That's so good, man. We have no excuse. If, if you're doing it, we have no excuse, none of us. Uh, one more. Uh, let's say you're meeting with somebody who's a bit earlier in their career, Mayor. They're 25, is 26, maybe they're a recent college grad. They want to leave a debt in the world. They want to do some good, but they're not really sure yet what they want to do. What are some general pieces of life slash career advice you'd give to that person? A positive affirmation, a learn self-care, Breathing exercise, it's, it's, it amazes me how some of the basic things we have, we are not teaching our children in school, which we're starting to do here in New York. Breathing is so crucial. We do it every day, but probably 90% of New Yorkers have never been taught, or Americans or human beings have never been taught how to breathe, why breath is important. Learn how to meditate. Learn how to find an outlet. Learn how to just believe. You know, it's almost hard to believe over 20 something years ago, I stated that I was going to be mayor January 1st, 2022. And it probably took a long time from me keep saying it over and over again before people realized that, hey, maybe this guy is not on medication. He's not crazy. You know, <laughs> maybe he's actually going to become the mayor. And it was because I believed why everyone was saying I couldn't. I remember mom giving me this one word that I put on my mirror, I-M-P-O-S-S-I-B-L-E, impossible. And she's told me to say it, and I said impossible. And then she said, baby, say the first two letters alone. And I said, I, second letter was M. And she, she said, now say the word, I said, possible. She said, that's right. I am possible. Impossible is for others. Eric, say I am possible. And that's all I know. I'm possible. And that's what I tell people who are starting out in their career. I am possible. And remind yourself that every day. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Eric Adams. It's it's my pleasure to, to, to have this conversation. And I would love to continue our dialogue as we both progress, man. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Good to see you, Ryan. Take care. Thank you. All right.